Mandatory Palestine Arabic Fleestan Palestine Hebrew Palestina Why Palestina A where A indicates Eretz Israel Land of Israel was a geopolitical entity established between 1920 and 1923 in the region of Palestine as part of the partition of the Ottoman Empire under the terms of the British Mandate for Palestine during the First World War 1914 an Arab uprising and the British Empire's Egyptian expeditionary force under General Edmund Allenby drove the Turks out of the Levant during the Sinai and Palestine campaign. The United Kingdom had agreed in the McMahon-Hussein correspondence that it would honor Arab independence if they revolted against the Ottomans, but the two sides had different interpretations of this agreement, and in the end, the UK and France divided up the area under the Sykes-Pickett Agreement an act of betrayal in the eyes of the Arabs. Further complicating the issue was the Balfour Declaration of 1917, promising British support for a Jewish national home in Palestine. At the war's end the British and French set up a joint occupied enemy territory administration in what had been Ottoman Syria. The British achieved legitimacy for their continued control by obtaining a mandate from the League of Nations in June 1922. The formal objective of the League of Nations mandate system was to administer parts of the defunct Ottoman Empire, which had been in control of the Middle East since the 16th century, until such time as they are able to stand alone. The civil mandate administration was formalized with the League of Nations consent in 1923 under the British Mandate for Palestine, which covered two administrative areas. The land west of the Jordan River, known as Palestine, was under direct British administration until 1948. The land east of the Jordan, a semi-autonomous region known as Transjordan, under the rule of the Hashemite family from the Hias, gained independence in 1946. During the British Mandate period, the area experienced the ascent of two major nationalist movements, one among the Jews and the other among the Arabs. The competing national interests of the Arab and Jewish populations of Palestine against each other and against the governing British authorities matured into the Arab Revolt of 1936–1939 and the Jewish insurgency in Palestine before culminating in the Civil War of 1947–1948. The aftermath of the Civil War and the consequent 1948 Arab-Israeli War led to the establishment of the 1949 ceasefire agreement, with partition of the former mandatory Palestine between the newborn state of Israel with a Jewish majority, the Arab West Bank annexed by the Jordanian Kingdom and the Arab All-Palestine government in the Gaza Strip under the Protectorate of Egypt. <laughs> History of Palestine under the British Mandate 1920s Following its occupation by British troops in 1917–1918, Palestine was governed by the Occupied Enemy Territory Administration. In July 1920 a civilian administration headed by a High Commissioner replaced the military administration. The first High Commissioner, Herbert Samuel, a Zionist and a recent British cabinet minister, arrived in Palestine on 20 June 1920 to take up his appointment from 1 July. Following the arrival of the British, the inhabitants established Muslim Christian associations in all the major towns. In 1919 they joined to hold the first Palestine Arab Congress in Jerusalem. It's aimed primarily at representative government and opposition to the Balfour Declaration. At the First World Congress of Jewish Women which was held in Vienna, Austria, 1923, it was decided that, "...it appears, therefore, to be the duty of all Jews to cooperate in the social-economic reconstruction of Palestine and to assist in the settlement of Jews in that country." The Zionist Commission formed in March 1918 and became active in promoting Zionist objectives in Palestine. On 19 April 1920, elections took place for the Assembly of Representatives of the Palestinian Jewish Community. The Zionist Commission received official recognition in 1922 as representative of the Palestinian Jewish Community. One of the first actions of the newly installed civil administration in 1921 had been to grant Pinhas Rutenberg a Jewish entrepreneur concessions for the production and distribution of electrical power. Rutenberg soon established an electric company whose shareholders were Zionist organizations, investors, and philanthropists. Palestinian Arabs saw it as proof that the British intended to favor Zionism. 
The British administration claimed that electrification would enhance the economic development of the country as a whole, while at the same time securing their commitment to facilitate a Jewish national home through economic—rather than political—means. Samuel tried to establish self-governing institutions in Palestine, as required by the mandate, but the Arab leadership refused to cooperate with any institution which included Jewish participation. When Grand Mufti of Jerusalem Kamil al husseini died in March 1921, High Commissioner Samuel appointed his half-brother Muhammad Amin al husseini to the position. Amin al husseini a member of the al husseini clan of Jerusalem, was an Arab nationalist and Muslim leader. As Grand Mufti, as well as in the other influential positions that he held during this period, al husseini played a key role in violent opposition to Zionism. In 1922, al-Husseini was elected president of the Supreme Muslim Council which had been established by Samuel in December 1921. The council controlled the WAQF funds, worth annually tens of thousands of pounds and the orphan funds, worth annually about £50,000, as compared to the £600,000 in the Jewish agency's annual budget. In addition, he controlled the Islamic courts in Palestine. Among other functions, these courts had the power to appoint teachers and preachers. The 1922 Palestine Order in Council established a legislative council, which was to consist of 23 members, 12 elected, 10 appointed, and the High Commissioner. Of the 12 elected members, 8 were to be Muslim Arabs, 2 Christian Arabs, and 2 Jews. Arabs protested against the distribution of the seats, arguing that as they constituted 88% of the population, having only 43% of the seats was unfair. Elections took place in February and March 1923, but due to an Arab boycott, the results were annulled and a 12 member advisory council was established. In October 1923, Britain provided the League of Nations with a report on the administration of Palestine for the period 1920 1922, which covered the period before the mandate. 1930s Arab armed insurgency In 1930, Sheikh Izz ad-Din al-Qassam arrived in Palestine from Syria and organized and established the Black Hand, an anti-Zionist and anti-British militant organization. He recruited and arranged military training for peasants and by 1935 he had enlisted between 200 and 800 men. The cells were equipped with bombs and firearms, which they used to kill Zionist settlers in the area, as well as engaging in a campaign of vandalism of the settlers' planted trees and British-constructed rail lines. In November 1935, two of his men engaged in a firefight with a Palestine police patrol hunting fruit thieves and a policeman was killed. Following the incident, British police launched a manhunt and surrounded Al-Qassam in a cave near Yabad. In the ensuing battle, Al-Qassam was killed. The Arab Revolt The death of Al-Qassam on 20 November 1935 generated widespread outrage in the Arab community. Huge crowds accompanied Qassam's body to his grave in Haifa. A few months later, in April 1936, the Arab National General Strike broke out. The strike lasted until October 1936, instigated by the Arab Higher Committee, headed by Amin al-Husseini. During the summer of that year, thousands of Jewish farmed acres and orchards were destroyed, Jewish civilians were attacked and killed, and some Jewish communities, such as those in Basin and Acre, fled to safer areas. Gilbert 1998, p. 80. The violence abated for about a year while the British sent the Peel Commission to investigate. Khalidi 2006, pp. 87-90. During the first stages of the Arab Revolt, due to rivalry between the clans of al-Husseini and Nashashibi among the Palestinian Arabs, Ragib Nashashibi was forced to flee to Egypt after several assassination attempts ordered by Amin al-Husseini. Following the Arab rejection of the Peel Commission recommendation, the revolt resumed in autumn of 1937. Over the next 18 months, the British lost control of Nablus and Hebron. British forces, supported by 6,000 armed Jewish auxiliary police, suppressed the widespread riots with overwhelming force. 
The British officer Charles Ord Wingate, who supported a Zionist revival for religious reasons, organized special night squads composed of British soldiers and Jewish volunteers such as Yigal Alon, which scored significant successes against the Arab rebels in the Lower Galilee and in the Jezreel Valley. Black 1991, p. 14, by conducting raids on Arab villages. Shapira 1992, pp. 247, 249, 350. The Jewish militia Irgun used violence also against Arab civilians as retaliatory acts, attacking marketplaces and buses. By the time the revolt concluded in March 1939, more than 5,000 Arabs, 400 Jews, and 200 British had been killed and at least 15,000 Arabs were wounded. The revolt resulted in the deaths of 5,000 Palestinian Arabs and the wounding of 10,000. In total, 10% of the adult Arab male population was killed, wounded, imprisoned, or exiled. Khalidi 2001, p. 26, from 1936 to 1945, while establishing collaborative security arrangements with the Jewish Agency, the British confiscated 13,200 firearms from Arabs and 521 weapons from Jews. The attacks on the Jewish population by Arabs had three lasting effects. First, they led to the formation and development of Jewish underground militias, primarily the Haganah, which were to prove decisive in 1948. Secondly, it became clear that the two communities could not be reconciled, and the idea of partition was born. Thirdly, the British responded to Arab opposition with the White Paper of 1939, which severely restricted Jewish land purchase and immigration. However, with the advent of World War II, even this reduced immigration quota was not reached. The White Paper policy also radicalized segments of the Jewish population, who after the war would no longer cooperate with the British. The revolt had a negative effect on Palestinian Arab leadership, social cohesion, and military capabilities and contributed to the outcome of the 1948 war because when the Palestinians faced their most fateful challenge in 1947-49, they were still suffering from the British repression of 1936-39, and were in effect without a unified leadership. Indeed, it might be argued that they were virtually without any leadership at all. Topic. Partition proposals In 1937, the Peel Commission proposed a partition between a small Jewish state, whose Arab population would have to be transferred, and an Arab state to be attached to Jordan. The proposal was rejected outright by the Arabs. The two main Jewish leaders, Chaim Wiseman and David Ben-Gurion, had convinced the Zionist Congress to approve equivocally the Peel recommendations as a basis for more negotiation. In a letter to his son in October 1937, Ben-Gurion explained that partition would be a first step to possession of the land as a whole. The same sentiment was recorded by Ben Gurion on other occasions, such as at a meeting of the Jewish Agency executive in June 1938, as well as by Chaim Wiseman. Following the London Conference 1939, the British government published a white paper which proposed a limit to Jewish immigration from Europe, restrictions on Jewish land purchases, and a program for creating an independent state to replace the mandate within ten years. This was seen by the Yishuv as betrayal of the mandatory terms, especially in light of the increasing persecution of Jews in Europe. In response, Zionists organized Aliyah Bet, a program of illegal immigration into Palestine. Lehi, a small group of extremist Zionists, staged armed attacks on British authorities in Palestine. However, the Jewish Agency, which represented the mainstream Zionist leadership, still hoped to persuade Britain to allow resumed Jewish immigration, and cooperated with Britain in World War II. <laughs> <laughs> World War II <laughs> 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 Allied and Axis activity On 10 June 1940, Italy declared war on the British Commonwealth and sided with Germany. Within a month, the Italians attacked Palestine from the air, bombing Tel Aviv and Haifa, inflicting multiple casualties. In 1942, there was a period of great concern for the Yishuv, when the forces of German General Erwin Rommel advanced east across North Africa towards the Suez Canal and there was fear that they would conquer Palestine. This period was referred to as the 200 Days of Dread. This event was the direct cause for the founding, with British support, of the Palmach, a highly trained regular unit belonging to Haganah a paramilitary group which was mostly made up of reserve troops. 
As in most of the Arab world, there was no unanimity amongst the Palestinian Arabs as to their position regarding the belligerents in World War II. A number of leaders and public figures saw an Axis victory as the likely outcome and a way of securing Palestine back from the Zionists and the British. Even though Arabs were not highly regarded by Nazi racial theory, the Nazis encouraged Arab support as a counter to British hegemony. SS Reichsfuhrer Heinrich Himmler was keen to exploit this, going so far as to enlist the aid of the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Muhammad Amin al-Husseini, sending him the following telegram on 2 November 1943. To the Grand Mufti, the National Socialist Movement of Greater Germany has, since its inception, inscribed upon its flag the fight against the world Jewry. It has therefore followed with particular sympathy the struggle of freedom-loving Arabs, especially in Palestine, against Jewish interlopers. In the recognition of this enemy and of the common struggle against it lies the firm foundation of the natural alliance that exists between the National Socialist Greater Germany and the freedom-loving Muslims of the whole world. In this spirit I am sending you on the anniversary of the infamous Balfour Declaration my hearty greetings and wishes for the successful pursuit of your struggle until the final victory, Reichsfuhrer SS. Heinrich Himmler The Mufti al-Husseini would spend the rest of the war in Nazi Germany and the occupied areas in Europe. <laughs> Mobilization On 3 July 1944, the British government consented to the establishment of a Jewish brigade, with hand-picked Jewish and also non-Jewish senior officers. On 20 September 1944, an official communique by the War Office announced the formation of the Jewish Brigade Group of the British Army. The Jewish Brigade then was stationed in Tarvizio, near the border triangle of Italy, Yugoslavia, and Austria, where it played a key role in the Baraha's efforts to help Jews escape Europe for Palestine, a role many of its members would continue after the brigade was disbanded. Among its projects was the education and care of the Selvino children. Later, veterans of the Jewish Brigade became key participants of the new state of Israel's Israel Defense Forces. From Palestine Regiment, two platoons, one Jewish, under the command of Brigadier Ernest Benjamin, and another Arab were sent to join Allied forces on the Italian front, having taken part of final offensive there. Besides Jews and Arabs from Palestine, in total by mid-1944 the British had assembled a multi-ethnic force consisting of volunteer European Jewish refugees from German-occupied countries, Yemenite Jews and Abyssinian Jews. The Holocaust and immigration quotas In 1939, as a consequence of the White Paper of 1939, the British reduced the number of immigrants allowed into Palestine. World War II and the Holocaust started shortly thereafter and once the 15,000 annual quota was exceeded, Jews fleeing Nazi persecution were interned in detention camps or deported to places such as Mauritius. Starting in 1939, a clandestine immigration effort called Aliyah Bet was spearheaded by an organization called Mossad Lelia Bet. Tens of thousands of European Jews escaped the Nazis in boats and small ships headed for Palestine. The Royal Navy intercepted many of the vessels, others were unseaworthy and were wrecked. A Haganah bomb sunk the SS Patria, killing 267 people, two more were sunk by Soviet submarines. The motor schooner Struma was torpedoed and sunk in the Black Sea by a Soviet submarine in February 1942 with the loss of nearly 800 lives. The last refugee boats to try to reach Palestine during the war were the Bulbul, Mefkor, and Marina in August 1944. A Soviet submarine sank the motor schooner Mefkor by torpedo and shellfire and machine gun survivors in the water, killing between 300 and 400 refugees. Illegal immigration resumed after World War II. After the war 250,000 Jewish refugees were stranded in displaced persons DP camps in Europe. Despite the pressure of world opinion, in particular the repeated requests of U.S. President Harry S. Truman and the recommendations of the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry that 100,000 Jews be immediately granted entry to Palestine, the British maintained the ban on immigration. Topic. Beginning of Zionist insurgency The Jewish Lehi Fighters for the Freedom of Israel and Ergun National Military Organization movements initiated violent uprisings against the British mandate in 1940s. 
On 6 November 1944, Eliyahu Hakim and Eliyahu Bet Zuri members of Lehi assassinated Lord Moyne in Cairo. Moyne was the British Minister of State for the Middle East and the assassination is said by some to have turned British Prime Minister Winston Churchill against the Zionist cause. After the assassination of Lord Moyne, the Haganah kidnapped, interrogated, and turned over to the British many members of the Irgun, the hunting season, and the Jewish agency executive decided on a series of measures against terrorist organizations in Palestine. Irgun ordered its members not to resist or retaliate with violence, so as to prevent a civil war. <laughs> After World War II, insurgency and the partition plan The three main Jewish underground forces later united to form the Jewish resistance movement and carry out several attacks and bombings against the British administration. In 1946, the Irgun blew up the King David Hotel in Jerusalem, the headquarters of the British administration, killing 92 people. Following the bombing, the British government began interning illegal Jewish immigrants in Cyprus. In 1948 the Lehi assassinated the UN mediator Count Bernadotte in Jerusalem. Yitzhak Shamir, future Prime Minister of Israel was one of the conspirators. The negative publicity resulting from the situation in Palestine caused the mandate to become widely unpopular in Britain, and caused the United States Congress to delay granting the British vital loans for reconstruction. The British Labour Party had promised before its election to allow mass Jewish migration into Palestine but reneged on this promise once in office. Anti-British Jewish militancy increased and the situation required the presence of over 100,000 British troops in the country. Following the Acre prison break and the retaliatory hanging of British sergeants by the Irgun, the British announced their desire to terminate the mandate and to withdraw by no later than the beginning of August 1948. The Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry in 1946 was a joint attempt by Britain and the United States to agree on a policy regarding the admission of Jews to Palestine. In April, the committee reported that its members had arrived at a unanimous decision. The committee approved the American recommendation of the immediate acceptance of 100,000 Jewish refugees from Europe into Palestine. It also recommended that there be no Arab, and no Jewish state. The committee stated that in order to dispose, once and for all, of the exclusive claims of Jews and Arabs to Palestine, we regard it as essential that a clear statement of principle should be made that Jew shall not dominate Arab and Arab shall not dominate Jew in Palestine." U.S. President Harry S. Truman angered the British government by issuing a statement supporting the 100,000 refugees but refusing to acknowledge the rest of the committee's findings. Britain had asked for U.S. assistance in implementing the recommendations. The U.S. War Department had said earlier that to assist Britain in maintaining order against an Arab revolt, an open-ended U.S. commitment of 300,000 troops would be necessary. The immediate admission of 100,000 new Jewish immigrants would almost certainly have provoked an Arab uprising. These events were the decisive factors that forced Britain to announce their desire to terminate the Palestine Mandate and place the question of Palestine before the United Nations, the successor to the League of Nations. The UN created UNSCOP, the UN Special Committee on Palestine, on the 15th of May 1947, with representatives from 11 countries. UNSCOP conducted hearings and made a general survey of the situation in Palestine, and issued its report on 31 August. Seven members Canada, Czechoslovakia, Guatemala, Netherlands, Peru, Sweden, and Uruguay recommended the creation of independent Arab and Jewish states, with Jerusalem to be placed under international administration. Three members India, Iran, and Yugoslavia supported the creation of a single federal state containing both Jewish and Arab constituent states. Australia abstained. On 29 November 1947, the UN General Assembly, voting 33-13, with 10 abstentions, adopted a resolution recommending the adoption and implementation of the Plan of Partition with Economic Union as Resolution 181-2, while making some adjustments to the boundaries between the two states proposed by it. The division was to take effect on the date of British withdrawal. The partition plan required that the proposed states grant full civil rights to all people within their borders, regardless of race, religion or gender. It is important to note that the UN General Assembly is only granted the power to make recommendations, therefore, Unger 181 was not legally binding. Both the US and the Soviet Union supported the resolution. 
Haiti, Liberia, and the Philippines changed their votes at the last moment after concerted pressure from the U.S. and from Zionist organizations. The five members of the Arab League, who were voting members at the time, voted against the plan. The Jewish Agency, which was the Jewish state in formation, accepted the plan, and nearly all the Jews in Palestine rejoiced at the news. The partition plan was rejected out of hand by Palestinian Arab leadership and by most of the Arab population. Meeting in Cairo on November and December 1947, the Arab League then adopted a series of resolutions endorsing a military solution to the conflict. Britain announced that it would accept the partition plan, but refused to enforce it, arguing it was not accepted by the Arabs. Britain also refused to share the administration of Palestine with the UN Palestine Commission during the transitional period. In September 1947, the British government announced that the mandate for Palestine would end at midnight on the 14th of May 1948. Some Jewish organizations also opposed the proposal. Ergun leader Menachem Begin announced, "The partition of the homeland is illegal. It will never be recognized. The signature by institutions and individuals of the partition agreement is invalid. It will not bind the Jewish people." Jerusalem was and will forever be our capital. Eretz Israel will be restored to the people of Israel. All of it. And forever." These views were publicly rejected by the majority of the nascent Jewish state. <laughs> Termination of the mandate When the UK announced the independence of Transjordan in 1946, the final assembly of the League of Nations and the General Assembly both adopted resolutions welcoming the news. The Jewish agency objected, claiming that Transjordan was an integral part of Palestine, and that according to Article 80 of the UN Charter, the Jewish people had a secured interest in its territory. During the General Assembly deliberations on Palestine, there were suggestions that it would be desirable to incorporate part of Transjordan's territory into the proposed Jewish state. A few days before the adoption of Resolution 181 on 29 November 1947, U.S. Secretary of State Marshall noted frequent references had been made by the Ad Hoc Committee regarding the desirability of the Jewish state having both the Negev and an outlet to the Red Sea and the port of Aqaba. According to John Snetzinger, Chaim Wiseman visited President Truman on 19 November 1947 and said it was imperative that the Negev and Port of Aqaba be under Jewish control and that they be included in the Jewish state. Truman telephoned the U.S. delegation to the U.N. and told them he supported Wiseman's position. However, the Transjordan Memorandum excluded territories of the Emirate of Transjordan from any Jewish settlement. Immediately after the UN resolution, the 1947 1948 civil war in Mandatory Palestine broke out between the Arab and Jewish communities, and British authority began to break down. On 16 December 1947, the Palestine police force withdrew from the Tel Aviv area, home to more than half the Jewish population, and turned over responsibility for the maintenance of law and order to Jewish police. As the civil war raged on, British military forces gradually withdrew from Palestine, although they occasionally intervened in favor of either side. As they withdrew, they handed over control to local authorities and locally raised police forces were charged with maintaining law and order. The areas they withdrew from often quickly became war zones. The British maintained strong presences in Jerusalem and Haifa, even as Jerusalem came under siege by Arab forces and became the scene of fierce fighting, though the British occasionally intervened in the fighting, largely to secure their evacuation routes, including by proclaiming martial law and enforcing truces. The Palestine police force was largely inoperative, and government services such as social welfare, control of water supplies, and postal services were withdrawn. In April 1948, the British withdrew from most of Haifa but retained an enclave in the port area to be used in the evacuation of British forces, and temporarily retained RAF Ramat David Airbase to cover their retreat, leaving behind a volunteer police force to maintain order. The city was quickly captured by the Haganah in the Battle of Haifa. Following the victory, British forces in Jerusalem announced that they had no intention of assuming control of any local administrations, but would not permit any actions that would hamper the safe and orderly withdrawal of British forces from Palestine, and would set up military courts to try persons who interfered. Although by this time British authority in most of Palestine had broken down, with most of the country in control of the Jews and Arabs, the British air and sea blockade of Palestine remained firmly in place. 
The British had notified the UN of their intent to terminate the mandate not later than 1 August 1948. However, early in 1948, the United Kingdom announced its firm intention to end its mandate in Palestine on 14 May. In response, President Harry S. Truman made a statement on 25 March proposing UN trusteeship rather than partition, stating that Unfortunately, it has become clear that the partition plan cannot be carried out at this time by peaceful means. Unless emergency action is taken, there will be no public authority in Palestine on that date capable of preserving law and order. Violence and bloodshed will descend upon the Holy Land. Large scale fighting among the people of that country will be the inevitable result. By 14 May 1948, the only British forces remaining in Palestine were in the Haifa area and in Jerusalem. On that same day, the British garrison in Jerusalem withdrew, and High Commissioner Alan Cunningham left the city for Haifa, where he was to leave the country by sea. The Jewish leadership, led by future Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, declared the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel, to be known as the State of Israel, on the afternoon of 14 May 1948 5 IYAR 5708 in the Hebrew calendar, to come into force at midnight of that day. On the same day, the Provisional Government of Israel asked the U.S. government for recognition, on the frontiers specified in the UN plan for partition. The United States immediately replied, recognizing, "...the provisional government as the de facto authority." On 15 May 1948, the Palestine Mandate ended and the State of Israel came into being. The Palestine government formally ceased to exist, the status of British forces still in the process of withdrawal from Haifa changed to occupiers of foreign territory, the Palestine police force formally stood down and was disbanded, with the remaining personnel evacuated alongside British military forces, the British blockade of Palestine was lifted, and all mandatory Palestine passports ceased to give British protection. The 1948 Palestinian exodus occurred in the period leading up to the end of the mandate and subsequently, over the next few days, approximately 700 Lebanese, 1,876 Syrian, 4,000 Iraqi, 2,800 Egyptian troops crossed over the borders and into Palestine. Around 4,500 Transjordanian troops, commanded partly by 38 British officers who had resigned their commissions in the British Army only weeks earlier, including overall commander, General John Bagot Glove, entered the Corpus Separatum region encompassing Jerusalem and its environs in response to the Haganah's Operation Kilshan, and moved into areas designated as part of the Arab state by the UN Partition Plan. Politics. Topic. Name The name given to the Mandate's territory was Palestine, in accordance with European traditions. The term Palestine was coined in the Western culture from the name of Palestina province of the Roman Syria Palestina and later Byzantine Empire Palestina Prima and Palestina Secunda. The Mandate Charter stipulated that Mandatory Palestine would have three official languages, namely English, Arabic and Hebrew. In 1926, the British authorities formally decided to use the traditional Arabic and Hebrew equivalents to the English name, i.e. Philastin Fleestin and Palestina Plastine respectively. The Jewish leadership proposed that the proper Hebrew name should be Eretz Yisrael Erz Yisrael equals Land of Israel. The final compromise was to add the initials of the Hebrew proposed name, Aleph Yud, within parenthesis, Y whenever the mandate's name was mentioned in Hebrew in official documents. The Arab leadership saw this compromise as a violation of the mandate terms. Some Arab politicians suggested that there should be a similar Arabic concession, such as Southern Syria, Sriya Aljnubit. The British authorities rejected this proposal. The divergent tendencies regarding the nature and purpose of the mandate are visible already in the discussions concerning the name for this new entity. According to the minutes of the ninth session of the League of Nations Permanent Mandate Commission, Colonel Symes explained that the country was described as Palestine by Europeans and as Falistin by the Arabs. The Hebrew name for the country was the designation Land of Israel, and the government, to meet Jewish wishes, had agreed that the word Palestine in Hebrew characters should be followed in all official documents by the initials which stood for that designation. As a set-off to this, certain of the Arab politicians suggested that the country should be called 
southern Syria, in order to emphasize its close relation with another Arab state. Topic: <inaudible> Arab Community. The resolution of the San Remo Conference contained a safeguarding clause for the existing rights of the non-Jewish communities. The conference accepted the terms of the mandate with reference to Palestine, on the understanding that there was inserted in the memorandum a legal undertaking by the mandatory power that it would not involve the surrender of the rights hitherto enjoyed by the non-Jewish communities in Palestine. The draft mandates for Mesopotamia and Palestine, and all of the post-war peace treaties contained clauses for the protection of religious groups and minorities. The mandates invoked the compulsory jurisdiction of the Permanent Court of International Justice in the event of any disputes. Article 62 of the Treaty of Berlin, 13 July 1878 dealt with religious freedom and civil and political rights in all parts of the Ottoman Empire. The guarantees have frequently been referred to as religious rights or minority rights. However, the guarantees included a prohibition against discrimination in civil and political matters. Difference of religion could not be alleged against any person as a ground for exclusion or incapacity in matters relating to the enjoyment of civil or political rights, admission to public employments, functions, and honors, or the exercise of the various professions and industries, in any locality whatsoever. A legal analysis performed by the International Court of Justice noted that the Covenant of the League of Nations had provisionally recognized the communities of Palestine as independent nations. The mandate simply marked a transitory period, with the aim and object of leading the mandated territory to become an independent self-governing state. Judge Higgins explained that the Palestinian people are entitled to their territory, to exercise self-determination, and to have their own state. Quote, the court said that specific guarantees regarding freedom of movement and access to the holy sites contained in the Treaty of Berlin 1878 had been preserved under the terms of the Palestine Mandate and a chapter of the United Nations Partition Plan for Palestine. According to historian Rashid Khalidi, the mandate ignored the political rights of the Arabs. The Arab leadership repeatedly pressed the British to grant them national and political rights, such as representative government, over Jewish national and political rights in the remaining 23% of the Mandate of Palestine which the British had set aside for a Jewish homeland. The Arabs reminded the British of President Wilson's 14 points and British promises during the First World War. The British however made acceptance of the terms of the mandate a precondition for any change in the constitutional position of the Arabs. A legislative council was proposed in the Palestine Order in Council, of 1922 which implemented the terms of the mandate. It stated that, "...no ordinance shall be passed which shall be in any way repugnant to or inconsistent with the provisions of the mandate." Quote, for the Arabs, this was unacceptable, as they felt that this would be self-murder. As a result, the Arabs boycotted the elections to the council held in 1923, which were subsequently annulled. During the whole interwar period, the British, appealing to the terms of the mandate, which they had designed themselves, rejected the principle of majority rule or any other measure that would give an Arab majority control over the government of Palestine. The terms of the mandate required the establishment of self governing institutions in both Palestine and Transjordan. In 1947, Foreign Secretary Bevan admitted that during the previous 25 years the British had done their best to further the legitimate aspirations of the Jewish communities without prejudicing the interests of the Arabs, but had failed to secure the development of self-governing institutions in accordance with the terms of the mandate. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Palestinian Arab leadership and national aspirations. Under the British mandate, the office of Mufti of Jerusalem, traditionally limited in authority and geographical scope, was refashioned into that of Grand Mufti of Palestine. Furthermore, a Supreme Muslim Council SMC was established and given various duties, such as the administration of religious endowments and the appointment of religious judges and local muftis. In Ottoman times, these duties had been fulfilled by the bureaucracy in Istanbul, Khalidi 2006, p. 63. 
In dealings with the Palestinian Arabs, the British negotiated with the elite rather than the middle or lower classes. Khalidi 2006, p. 52. They chose Haj Amin al Husseini to become Grand Mufti, although he was young and had received the fewest votes from Jerusalem's Islamic leaders. Khalidi 2006, pp. 56 57. One of the Mufti's rivals, Raghib Bey al Nashashibi, had already been appointed mayor of Jerusalem in 1920, replacing Musa Kazim, whom the British removed after the Nabi Musa riots of 1920. Khalidi 2006, pp. 63, 69. Segev 2000, pp. 120. To 144, during which he exhorted the crowd to give their blood for Palestine. Morris 2001, p. 112. During the entire mandate period, but especially during the latter half, the rivalry between the Mufti and al Nashashibi dominated Palestinian politics. Khalidi ascribes the failure of the Palestinian leaders to enroll mass support, because of their experiences during the Ottoman Empire period, as they were then part of the ruling elite and accustomed to their commands being obeyed. The idea of mobilizing the masses was thoroughly alien to them. Khalidi 2006, p. 81. There had already been rioting and attacks on and massacres of Jews in 1921 and 1929. During the 1930s, Palestinian Arab popular discontent with Jewish immigration grew. In the late 1920s and early 1930s, several factions of Palestinian society, especially from the younger generation, became impatient with the internecine divisions and ineffectiveness of the Palestinian elite and engaged in grassroots anti-British and anti-Zionist activism, organized by groups such as the Young Men's Muslim Association. There was also support for the Radical Nationalist Independence Party which called for a boycott of the British in the manner of the Indian Congress Party. Some took to the hills to fight the British and the Jews. Most of these initiatives were contained and defeated by notables in the pay of the mandatory administration, particularly the Mufti and his cousin Jamal al-Husseini. A six-month general strike in 1936 marked the start of the Great Arab Revolt, Khalidi 2006, pp. 87-90. Jewish Yishuv The conquest of the Ottoman Syria by the British forces in 1917, found a mixed community in the region, with Palestine, the southern part of the Ottoman Syria, containing a mixed population of Muslims, Christians, Jews and Druze. In this period, the Jewish community Yishuv in Palestine was composed of traditional Jewish communities in cities the old Yishuv, which had existed for centuries, and the newly established agricultural Zionist communities the new Yishuv, established since the 1870s. With the establishment of the Mandate, the Jewish community in Palestine formed the Zionist Commission to represent its interests. In 1929, the Jewish Agency for Palestine took over from the Zionist Commission its representative functions and administration of the Jewish community. During the Mandate period, the Jewish Agency was a quasi-governmental organization that served the administrative needs of the Jewish community. Its leadership was elected by Jews from all over the world by proportional representation. The Jewish Agency was charged with facilitating Jewish immigration to Palestine, land purchase and planning the general policies of the Zionist leadership. It ran schools and hospitals, and formed the Haganah. The British authorities offered to create a similar Arab agency but this offer was rejected by Arab leaders. In response to numerous Arab attacks on Jewish communities, the Haganah, a Jewish paramilitary organization, was formed on 15 June 1920 to defend Jewish residents. Tensions led to widespread violent disturbances on several occasions, notably in 1921 see Jaffa riots, 1929 primarily violent attacks by Arabs on Jews—see 1929 Hebron massacre and 1936–1939. Beginning in 1936, Jewish groups such as Etzel Ergun and Lehi Stern Gang conducted campaigns of violence against British military and Arab targets. Jewish immigration During the mandate, the Yishuv or Jewish community in Palestine, grew from one-sixth to almost one-third of the population. According to official records, 367,845 Jews and 33,304 non-Jews immigrated legally between 1920 and 1945. It was estimated that another 50–60,000 Jews and a marginal number of Arabs, the latter mostly on a seasonal basis, immigrated illegally during this period. 
Immigration accounted for most of the increase of Jewish population, while the non-Jewish population increase was largely natural. Of the Jewish immigrants, in 1939 most had come from Germany and Czechoslovakia, but in 1940–1944 most came from Romania and Poland, with an additional 3,530 immigrants arriving from Yemen during the same period. Initially, Jewish immigration to Palestine met little opposition from the Palestinian Arabs. However, as antisemitism grew in Europe during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Jewish immigration mostly from Europe to Palestine began to increase markedly. Combined with the growth of Arab nationalism in the region and increasing anti-Jewish sentiments the growth of Jewish population created much Arab resentment. The British government placed limitations on Jewish immigration to Palestine. These quotas were controversial, particularly in the latter years of British rule, and both Arabs and Jews disliked the policy, each for their own reasons. Jewish immigrants were to be afforded Palestinian citizenship Article 7. The administration of Palestine shall be responsible for enacting a nationality law. There shall be included in this law provisions framed so as to facilitate the acquisition of Palestinian citizenship by Jews who take up their permanent residence in Palestine. Topic. Jewish National Home In 1919, the General Secretary and future President of the Zionist organization, Nahum Sokolow, published History of Zionism 1600 He also represented the Zionist organization at the Paris Peace Conference. One of the objectives of British administration was to give effect to the Balfour Declaration of 1917, which was also set out in the preamble of the mandate, as follows Whereas the principal Allied powers have also agreed that the mandatory should be responsible for putting into effect the declaration originally made on November 2, 1917, by the government of His Britannic Majesty, and adopted by the said powers, in favor of the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, it being clearly understood that nothing should be done which might prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. The United Nations Special Committee on Palestine said the Jewish National Home, which derived from the formulation of Zionist aspirations in the 1897 Ball program has provoked many discussions concerning its meaning, scope and legal character, especially since it had no known legal connotation and there are no precedents in international law for its interpretation. It was used in the Balfour Declaration and in the Mandate, both of which promised the establishment of a Jewish National Home without, however, defining its meaning. A statement on British policy in Palestine, issued on 3 June 1922 by the Colonial Office, placed a restrictive construction upon the Balfour Declaration. The statement included, "...the disappearance or subordination of the Arabic population, language or customs in Palestine," or, "...the imposition of Jewish nationality upon the inhabitants of Palestine as a whole." and made it clear that in the eyes of the mandatory power, the Jewish national home was to be founded in Palestine and not that Palestine as a whole was to be converted into a Jewish national home. The committee noted that the construction, which restricted considerably the scope of the national home, was made prior to the confirmation of the mandate by the Council of the League of Nations and was formally accepted at the time by the executive of the Zionist organization. In March 1930, Lord Passfield, the Secretary of State for the Colonies, had written a cabinet paper which said, in the Balfour Declaration there is no suggestion that the Jews should be accorded a special or favoured position in Palestine as compared with the Arab inhabitants of the country, or that the claims of Palestinians to enjoy self-government subject to the rendering of administrative advice and assistance by a mandatory as foreshadowed in Article 22 of the Covenant should be curtailed in order to facilitate the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people Zionist leaders have not concealed and do not conceal their opposition to the grant of any measure of self-government to the people of Palestine either now or for many years to come. Some of them even go so far as to claim that that provision of Article 2 of the Mandate constitutes a bar to compliance with the demand of the Arabs for any measure of self-government. In view of the provisions of Article 22 of the Covenant and of the promises made to the Arabs on several occasions that claim is inadmissible. The League of Nations Permanent Mandates Commission took the position that the mandate contained a dual obligation. 
In 1932 the Mandates Commission questioned the representative of the mandatory on the demands made by the Arab population regarding the establishment of self-governing institutions, in accordance with various articles of the Mandate, and in particular Article 2. The chairman noted that under the terms of the same article, the mandatory power had long since set up the Jewish national home." In 1937, the Peel Commission, a British royal commission headed by Earl Peel, proposed solving the Arab-Jewish conflict by partitioning Palestine into two states. The two main Jewish leaders, Chaim Wiseman and David Ben-Gurion, had convinced the Zionist Congress to approve equivocally the Peel recommendations as a basis for more negotiation. The U.S. Consul General at Jerusalem told the State Department that the Mufti had refused the principle of partition and declined to consider it. The Consul said that the Emir Abdullah urged acceptance on the ground that realities must be faced, but wanted modification of the proposed boundaries and Arab administrations in the neutral enclave. The Consul also noted that Nasha Shibi sidestepped the principle, but was willing to negotiate for favorable modifications. A collection of private correspondence published by David Ben Gurion contained a letter written in 1937 which explained that he was in favor of partition because he didn't envision a partial Jewish state as the end of the process. Ben Gurion wrote, What we want is not that the country be united and whole, but that the united and whole country be Jewish. He explained that a first-class Jewish army would permit Zionists to settle in the rest of the country with or without the consent of the Arabs. Benny Morris said that both Chaim Wiseman and David Ben-Gurion saw partition as a stepping stone to further expansion and the eventual takeover of the whole of Palestine. Former Israeli foreign minister and historian Shlomo Ben-Ami writes that 1937 was the same year that the field battalions under Yitzhak Sade wrote the Avner Plan which anticipated and laid the groundwork for what would become in 1948. Plan D it envisioned going far beyond any boundaries contained in the existing partition proposals and planned the conquest of the Galilee, the West Bank, and Jerusalem. In 1942, the Biltmore Program was adopted as the platform of the World Zionist Organization. It demanded that Palestine be established as a Jewish commonwealth. In 1946 an Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry noted that the demand for a Jewish state went beyond the obligations of either the Balfour Declaration or the Mandate and had been expressly disowned by the chairman of the Jewish Agency as recently as 1932. The Jewish Agency subsequently refused to accept the subsequent Morrison-Grady plan as the basis for discussion. A spokesman for the agency, Eliyahu Epstein, told the U.S. State Department that the agency could not attend the London conference if the Grady Morrison proposal was on the agenda. He stated that the agency was unwilling to be placed in a position where it might have to compromise between the Grady Morrison proposals on the one hand and its own partition plan on the other. He stated that the agency had accepted partition as the solution for Palestine which it favored. Topic. Land ownership After transition to the British rule, much of the agricultural land in Palestine about one-third of the whole territory was still owned by the same landowners as under Ottoman rule, mostly powerful Arab clans and local Muslim sheikhs. Other lands had been held by foreign Christian organizations most notably the Greek Orthodox Church, as well as Jewish private and Zionist organizations, and to lesser degree by small minorities of Baha'is, Samaritans and Circassians. As of 1931, the territory of the British Mandate of Palestine was 26,625,600 dunams, 26,625.6 square kilometers, of which 8,252,900 dunams, 8,252.9 square kilometers, or 33% were arable. Official statistics show that Jews privately and collectively owned 1,393,531 dunams, 1,393.53 square kilometers, or 5.23% of Palestine's total in 1945. The Jewish-owned agricultural land was largely located in the Galilee and along the coastal plain. Estimates of the total volume of land that Jews had purchased by 15 May 1948 are complicated by illegal and unregistered land transfers, as well as by the lack of data on land concessions from the Palestine administration after 31 March 1936. 
According to Avneri, Jews held 1,850,000 dunams, 1,850 square kilometers of land in 1947 or 6.94% of the total. Stein gives the estimate of 2 million dunams, 2,000 square kilometers as of May 1948 or 7.51% of the total. According to Fischbach, by 1948, Jews and Jewish companies owned 20% percent of all cultivable land in the country. Nevertheless, the amount of land owned by Jews is easier to calculate than that owned by Arabs. It is difficult to reckon the total amount of land owned by Arabs, Muslim, Christian, and Druze in Mandatory Palestine. The 1945 UN estimate shows that Arab ownership of arable land was on average 68% of a district, ranging from 15% ownership in the Bir Sheba district to 99% ownership in the Ramallah district. These data cannot be fully understood without comparing them to those of neighboring countries. In Iraq, for instance, still in 1951, only 0.3% of registered land or 50% of the total amount was categorized as private property. Topic. Land ownership by district The following table shows the 1945 land ownership of Mandatory Palestine by district Topic. Land ownership by corporation The table below shows the land ownership of Palestine by large Jewish corporations in square kilometers on 31 December 1945. Topic. Land ownership by type The land owned privately and collectively by Jews, Arabs and other non-Jews can be classified as urban, rural built on, cultivable farmed, and uncultivable. The following chart shows the ownership by Jews, Arabs and other non-Jews in each of the categories. Topic. List of mandatory land laws Land Transfer Ordinance of 1920 1926 Correction of Land Registers Ordinance Land Settlement Ordinance of 1928 Land Transfer Regulations of 1940 In February 1940, the British Government of Palestine promulgated the Land Transfer Regulations which divided Palestine into three regions with different restrictions on land sales applying to each. In Zone A which included the hill country of Judea as a whole, certain areas in the Jaffa subdistrict, and in the Gaza district, and the northern part of the Beersheba subdistrict. New agreements for sale of land other than to a Palestinian Arab were forbidden without the High Commissioner's permission. In Zone B, which included the Jezreel Valley, Eastern Galilee, a parcel of coastal plain south of Haifa, a region northeast of the Gaza district, and the southern part of the Beersheba subdistrict, sale of land by a Palestinian Arab was forbidden except to a Palestinian Arab with similar exceptions. In the free zone, which consisted of Haifa Bay, the coastal plain from Zikron Yaakov to Yibna, and the neighborhood of Jerusalem, there were no restrictions. The reason given for the regulations was that the mandatory was required to ensure e that the rights and positions of other sections of the population are not prejudiced and an assertion that such transfers of land must be restricted if arab cultivators are to maintain their existing standard of life and a considerable landless arab population is not soon to be created topic <laughs> demographics topic British censuses and estimations In 1920, the majority of the approximately 750,000 people in this multi-ethnic region were Arabic-speaking Muslims, including a Bedouin population estimated at 103,331 at the time of the 1922 census and concentrated in the Beersheba area and the region south and east of it, as well as Jews who comprised some 11% of the total and smaller groups of Druze, Syrians. Sudanese, Somalis, Circassians, Egyptians, Copts, Greeks, and Hejazi Arabs. The first census of 1922 showed a population of 757,182, of whom 78% were Muslim, 11% Jewish and 10% Christian. 
The second census, of 1931, gave a total population of 1,035,154 of whom 73.4% were Muslim, 16.9% Jewish and 8.6% Christian. A discrepancy between the two censuses and records of births, deaths and immigration, led the authors of the second census to postulate the illegal immigration of about 9,000 Jews and 4,000 Arabs during the intervening years. There were no further censuses but statistics were maintained by counting births, deaths and migration. By the end of 1936 the total population was approximately 1,300,000, the Jews being estimated at 384,000. The Arabs had also increased their numbers rapidly, mainly as a result of the cessation of the military conscription imposed on the country by the Ottoman Empire, the campaign against malaria and a general improvement in health services. In absolute figures their increase exceeded that of the Jewish population, but proportionally, the latter had risen from 13% of the total population at the census of 1922 to nearly 30% at the end of 1936. Some components such as illegal immigration could only be estimated approximately. The White Paper of 1939, which placed immigration restrictions on Jews, stated that the Jewish population has risen to some 450,000 and was approaching a third of the entire population of the country." In 1945, a demographic study showed that the population had grown to 1,764,520, comprising 1,061,270 Muslims, 553,600 Jews, 135,550 Christians and 14,100 people of other groups. By district The following table gives the religious demography of each of the 16 districts of the mandate in 1945. <laughs> <laughs> Government and institutions Under the terms of the August 1922 Palestine Order in Council, the Mandate Territory was divided into administrative regions known as districts and administered by the Office of the British High Commissioner for Palestine. Britain continued the millet system of the Ottoman Empire whereby all matters of a religious nature and personal status were within the jurisdiction of Muslim courts and the courts of other recognised religions, called confessional communities. The High Commissioner established the Orthodox Rabbinate and retained a modified millet system which only recognized eleven religious communities, Muslims, Jews and nine Christian denominations none of which were Christian Protestant churches. All those who were not members of these recognized communities were excluded from the millet arrangement. As a result, there was no possibility, for example, of marriages between confessional communities, and there were no civil marriages. Personal contacts between communities were nominal. Apart from the religious courts, the judicial system was modelled on the British one, having a high court with appellate jurisdiction and the power of review over the Central Court and the Central Criminal Court. The five consecutive Chief Justices were Thomas Haycraft (1921–1927), Michael Macdonald (1927–1936), Harry Herbert Trusted (1936–1941), afterwards Chief Justice of the Federated Malay States. 1941 Frederick Gordon Smith 1941 to 1944 William James Fitzgerald 1944 to 1948 Topic Economy Between 1922 and 1947, the annual growth rate of the Jewish sector of the economy was 13.2%, mainly due to immigration and foreign capital, while that of the Arab was 6.5%. Per capita, these figures were 4.8% and 3.6% respectively. By 1936, the Jewish sector earned 2.6 times as much as Arabs. Compared to other Arab countries, the Palestinian Arab individuals earned slightly more. The Jaffa Electric Company was founded in 1923 by Pinhas Rutenberg, and was later absorbed into a newly created Palestine Electric Company. Palestine Airways was founded in 1934, Angel Bakeries in 1927, and the T. Nuva Dairy in 1926. Electric current mainly flowed to Jewish industry, following it to its nestled locations in Tel Aviv and Haifa. 
Although Tel Aviv had by far more workshops and factories, the demand for electric power for industry was roughly the same for both cities by the early 1930s. The country's largest industrial zone was in Haifa, where many housing projects were built for employees. On the scale of the UN Human Development Index determined for around 1939, of 36 countries, Palestinian Jews were placed 15th, Palestinian Arabs 30th, Egypt 33rd and Turkey 35th. The Jews in Palestine were mainly urban, 76.2% in 1942, while the Arabs were mainly rural, 68.3% in 1942. Overall, Khalidi concludes that Palestinian Arab society, while overmatched by the Yishuv, was as advanced as any other Arab society in the region and considerably more than several. Topic education Under the British mandate, the country developed economically and culturally. In 1919 the Jewish community founded a centralized Hebrew school system, and the following year established the Assembly of Representatives, the Jewish National Council and the Histadrit Labor Federation. The Technion University was founded in 1924, and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in 1925. Literacy rates in 1932 were 86% for the Jews compared to 22% for the Palestinian Arabs, but Arab literacy rates steadily increased thereafter. Palestinian Arabs compared favorably in this respect to residents of Egypt and Turkey, but unfavorably to the Lebanese. Topic gallery topic See also Ernest Bevin Herbert Daubigan Police Expert Faisal Wiseman Agreement 1919, Havara Agreement 1933, High Commissioners for Palestine and Transjordan-Israeli Declaration of Independence List of Post Offices in the British Mandate of Palestine Mandatory Palestine Passport Museum of Underground Prisoners Palestine Command Palestine Pound Postage Stamps and Postal History of Palestine Russian Compound Charles Tegart 1881-1946 Police Expert Tegert's Wall The Sergeant's Affair Liberal Party Mandatory Palestine Topic References Topic Notes Topic Quotes Topic Bibliography Pape, Elon The 15th of August 1994. Introduction. The Making of the Arab-Israeli Conflict, 1947-1951. I.B. Tories. ISBN 978-1-85043-819-9. Retrieved 2 May 2009. Khalidi, Rashid 2006. The Iron Cage, The Story of the Palestinian Struggle for Statehood. Beacon Press. ISBN 978-0-8070-0308-4. Retrieved 2 May 2009. Khalidi, Rashid 2007 First Ed. 2001. The Palestinians and 1948, The Underlying Causes of Failure. In Eugene L. Rogan and Avi Slame. The War for Palestine, Rewriting the History of 1948 2nd ed. Cambridge University Press. ISBN 978-0-521-69934-1. Retrieved 2 May 2009. Khalidi, Walid 1987 Original in 1971. From Haven to Conquest, Readings in Zionism and the Palestine Problem until 1948. Institute for Palestine Studies. ISBN 978-0-88728-155-6. Retrieved 2 May 2009. Morris, Benny 2001 Righteous Victims, A History of the Zionist Arab Conflict, 1881-1999. New York, Alfred A. Knopf. ISBN 978-0-679-74475-7. Retrieved 2 May 2009. Arori, Nazir Hassan Jordan, A Study in Political Development 1923-1965. The Hague, Martinus Nijhoff Publishers. ISBN 978-90-247-1217-5. Retrieved 2 May 2009. Biger, Gideon The Boundaries of Modern Palestine, 1840-1947. London, Routledge. ISBN 978-0-7146-5654-0. Retrieved 2 May 2009. Lewis, W. M. Roger The United Kingdom and the Beginning of the Mandate System, 1919-1922. International Organization. 23 73-96. Doi 10.1017 per seconds 00208183002553434. Segev, Tom. 2001. Original in 2000. 
Nebi Musa, 1920. One Palestine, Complete, Jews and Arabs under the British Mandate. Trans. Chaim Watsman. London, Henry Holt and Company. ISBN 978-0-8050-6587-9. Retrieved 2 May 2009. Stein, Kenneth W. Original in 1984. The Land Question in Palestine, 1917–1939. University of North Carolina Press. ISBN 978-0-8078-4178-5. Retrieved 2 May 2009. Gilbert, Martin Israel, A History. Doubleday. ISBN 978-0-385-40401-3. Retrieved 2 May 2009. Shapira, Anita Land and Power, The Zionist Resort to Force, 1881–1948, Trans. William Templer. Oxford University Press. ISBN 978-0-19-506104-8. Retrieved 2 May 2009. Black, Ian Israel's Secret Wars, A History of Israel's Intelligence Services. Morris, Benny. Grove Press. ISBN 978-0-8021-1159-3. Avneri, Aryeh The Claim of Dispossession, Jewish Land Settlement and the Arabs, 1878–1948. Transaction Publishers. ISBN 978-0-87855-964-0. Retrieved 2 May 2009. Caliph, Issa Politics in Palestine, Arab Factionalism and Social Disintegration, 1939-1948. State University of New York Press. ISBN 978-0-7914-0708-0. Retrieved 6 May 2009. Bayliss, Thomas How Israel Was Won, A Concise History of the Arab-Israeli Conflict. Lexington Books. ISBN 978-0-7391-0064-6 Bethel, Nicholas The Palestine Triangle, The Struggle Between the British, the Jews and the Arabs, 1935-48, London, Deutsch, 1979 ISBN 0-233970699-X. Leini, Rosa I. M. 2006. Mandated Landscape, British Imperial Rule in Palestine, 1929-1948. London, Routledge. ISBN 978-0-7146-5426-3. Retrieved 5 May 2009. Hughes, Matthew, ed. 2004. Allenby in Palestine, The Middle East Correspondence of Field Marshal Viscount Allenby June 1917 – October 1919. Army Records Society, 22. Phoenix Mill, Thrupp, Stroud, Gloucestershire, Sutton Publishing Ltd. ISBN 978-0-7509-3841-9. Katz, Shmuel Battleground, Fact and Fantasy in Palestine. Bantam Books. ISBN 978-0-929093-13-0. Retrieved 2 May 2009. Paris, Timothy J. Britain, The Hashemites and Arab Rule, 1920-1925, The Sharifian Solution. London, Routledge. ISBN 0-7146-5451-5 Sherman, A. J. Mandate Days, British Lives in Palestine, 1918-1948, Thames and Hudson. ISBN 0-8018-6620-0 Viriles, Guillaume Les Frontiers de la Palestine, 1914-1947, Paris, Larmatin. ISBN 978-2-296-13621-2 Further reading Wright, Quincy, The Palestine Problem, Political Science Quarterly, Vol. 41, No. 3 September, 1926, pp. 384-412, via JSTOR Hanna, Paul Lamont British Policy in Palestine. Washington, D.C., American Council on Public Affairs, 1942 Miller, Rory, ed. Britain, Palestine and Empire, The Mandate Years 2010. Ravnell, Ellen Jenny. 
Exit Britain, British withdrawal from the Palestine Mandate in the Early Cold War, 1947–1948", Diplomacy and Statecraft, September 2010 21 No. 3 pp. 416–433. Roberts, Nicholas E. Re-remembering the Mandate, Historiographical Debates and Revisionist History in the Study of British Palestine. History Compass, March 2011, 9 No. 3, pp. 215 to 230. Camel, Lorenzo. Whose land? Land tenure in late 19th and early 20th century Palestine. British Journal of Middle Eastern Studies, April 2014, 41, 2, pp. 230 to 242. Topic: Primary sources. Golani, Mahdi, ed. The End of the British Mandate for Palestine, 1948, The Diary of Sir Henry Gurney 2009. <inaudible> <inaudible> External links Media related to British Mandate of Palestine at Wikimedia Commons <inaudible>